we're good to go, are we? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've been live for a while. It's going to wait till three, nearly three. Okay, right, we're starting to record. Right, I think we'll make a start now then, shall we? Um, welcome everybody to the third session of the Sheep Vet Society virtual conference. Um, I'm going to very shortly hand over to Nick Hart, um, the current Sheep Vet Society president, who is going to chair this session. Um, we are being quite ambitious. Um, we have got um, speakers from Malawi, our three really valued speakers, and then we've got Adam there as well uh, from the UK and uh, Nick and I from the UK, and we've got some videos to play. Um, don't worry too much if you can't hear the video because we can speak over them and we certainly can ask questions. Um, if you can make sure that you, the speakers are turned up on your laptops or whatever you're watching this on so that you can hear those videos well, that would, that would be great. Um, we've got the chat function and we've also got the question and answer function as well for you to um, ask any questions as we go along. Um, but without further ado, I am going to hand over to Nick um, to start the session. Thanks. Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. This is um, a very exciting venture for the SVS and we're fantastically proud to welcome members of Malawi's State University. Um, I'd like to introduce first Professor Maliku Tathira, who is the, I should have to read it out because it head of Department of Biomedical Sciences at Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources, Malawi. And he is also present with two of his final year students, which is Laston, I hope I get this right, Lawson Chimaliro, I hope that's roughly right, and Precious Mastala. And also a very good friend of mine, Adam Jolly, who is a UK friend, if you like, for the Malawi University and has been there many times. And he's going to do a little bit in telling us about how the university works. So the professor is going to kick off, but I'm just going to tell you a few, little bit about him. He is a remarkable man, has done a fantastic job for the training of Malawi's own students. In other words, students who have trained, been trained within the country. And the professor trained in Addis Ababa, qualifying in 1985. He's had done further studies in France, Norway and Canada. And as I said just now, he's currently head of their department. So we're going to start with the professor talking a little bit about what he does and stuff. And then Adam is going to talk a little bit about the university. And then we're going to move into the videos and chat from the prof from, and from his two students. And hopefully the technology will match our desires. If not, we will make it work. And everybody put their thumbs up and smile and then we're good to go. Everybody's happy? Smile, guys. Okay, last thing, you're not smiling, come on. Yes, he is now, ah, that's better, good, okay. Okay, so over to you, Prof, perhaps you'd like to do your first bit for us now, that'd be fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the Chief of Society for inviting us to present the participation the conference. And, uh, like just to to tell you what we do here in Malawi. Malawi is a, a small country in southern Africa. It's about 120 kilometers square and 18 million population. Uh, economy is highly dependent on agriculture, mainly maize. Crop and livestock are not integrated. The soil is uh, depleted, so without fertilizer, it cannot produce maize. So it's heavily depends on fertilizer. And there are frequent drought and uh, flooding. Livestock, uh, the major livestock are goat, which is about 8 million, 1 million cattle, 1 million swine, and uh, about less than 100,000 sheep. Um, so no horses and um, maybe some 20,000 donkeys. Uh, 
So in Malawi, uh, after independence in 1960, there, there was no much progress done towards the veterinary services. So in 2014, we established the first vet school, uh, which trains uh, veterinary doctors, which is a six year program. And this is the single major change after independence in the veterinary uh, system of Malawi, because uh, in 2019, we produced um, 12 veterinarians. And uh, yeah, so this will improve the, the health situation in Malawi because there were no veterinarians. And uh, Malawi is in the hot spot where there are emerging diseases, you know, to, to, the, to the east, there is uh, to the, to the west, there is Democratic Republic of Congo, where there is Ebola and other diseases. So this is a hot spot. There are a lot of forests, wildlife, and uh, in Malawi, meat consumption, the people, they like to eat meat, any meat, bush meat, and many types of unconventional animals. So uh, there is, again, problem of antibiotic resistance, and what have we so establishing the vet faculty will mitigate this, these problems. So our faculty uh, in the Sadek region the, is the only vet school where pe uh, students do their final uh, thesis be before they, they graduate. In the other vet schools, they, they graduate by simply doing only clinical rotation. So research is our main main activity and also train on early clinical induction and we have a good partnership university industry linkage in which Dr. Adam also comes there establishing the LACPCA Lilonga site for protection and care of animals where our students practice. Today what I'm going to present is that the most of the research in Africa uh, they are mainly for publication so this Michigan University came with an idea, what they call is design thinking. So with this de design thinking, you have to empathize first, define, ideate, then you produce prototype, then you test the prototype and uh, you produce a product. And uh, this product can be commercialized or patented. So with this in idea, we would like to, we wanted to improve the goat health in Malawi. So using uh, this telemedicine and uh, producing some technologies that help to control some diseases. So, uh, and the other two students, they are going to do, to present what they have done during some of their rotations. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So, Dr. Adam, you can say something on our school lords. He's our partner. Can you can you mute yourself? Please? I'm, I'm unmuted. So, so I just want to put um, some context to what uh, the professor's just said, and uh, for Last and, and for Precious as well. It's quite remarkable. Both Professor Professor Laston and Precious are examples of you know we're in Britain. We, We've got a tradition of James Herrick. We all grew up with that. We saw vets working with. When the vet school was set up in Malawi, there were only 14 active vets in the whole of the country. Um, I worked there for a brief period of time. I was the only vet on call for the entire country at one point. As Nick will remember, I didn't like much being in call on Ross and Why? Because a lot, it was a lot busier in, 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 in Malawi. Although, so they've come from a standing start. Uh, when you see these talks by, given by these incredible human beings who have done it, and you can see the internet connection isn't great, so they're working from books, some of which are dating back from the 1960s uh, when they started their libraries. A prof is nodding away. Um, so they have none of, the, none of the resources that we're used to in the UK, incredible resources we had even when I qualified 25 years ago. So what you're about to see, put it in the context of imagining uh, a lecture theatre where chickens and goats are running through your legs while professors talking to you. I don't want to cast aspersions about that. It's mainly taught by 
the prof. There are external lecturers who come in. When they were examined, the 2019 batch of 12 vets, they were examined by externals from around the world, including some you know, people from Emory University as well, and they all thought they were remarkable. And at the standards of guys qualifying from Edinburgh and universities around the world at the time, with the resources, which would be 0.1% of what we get in the UK resources and other universities around the world. So put some context into it. These are human beings who are remarkably remarkable the, the things they've overcome they didn't even really know that the context of how a vet operates because there hasn't there isn't a history of that in, in Malawi all the vets were trained abroad and then you'll see these talks given by these two brilliant I've seen the talks that they're fantastic better than anything I ever produced 25 years ago Nick can attest to that as well because he got me as a raw new graduate I'll hand over to professor but but you really need to understand how remarkable this man is and how remarkable these these chaps are here who are about to give this talk as well um, and I'll turn back to them. Thank you Adam, thank you very much. Okay Philip, are we going to run the first video? What are you going to do? To I haven't done any sound, Philippa. Yeah, I can't hear that either. Yeah, Should Prof talk over this? Explain what's going on. Can you talk over this, Prof? Okay, like uh, this is... Uh... A small project in collaboration with uh, Michigan State University, Innovation Scholar Program. So, we'd like to improve Malawian goods through animal health and nutrition. So, in Malawi, mainly goats are kept, sheep are less. The proportion is 1 to 20. So, there are 8 million goats, but less than 100,000 sheep. So uh, the main problem when we empathize, they told us the main problem is uh, disease. And the major diseases are tick and tick-borne diseases. Of course, feed is available, but most of the crop residue is burned. And uh, it's not nutritious because, as I said, the soil is infertile, so there is lack of some um, mineral deficiencies are common. And uh, the genotype is, again, very uh, not productive. Like, we have the Stenan type of goats. These white goats, this season, they are Stenan. They weigh up to 60 kilogram, but... Uh, the other ones are the local breeds. They, are, they weigh about 20 kilograms. So there's a trail on improving the genotype. It means it's not only disease, but nutrition, breeding of these animals is also a, a problem. And as you can see them from this uh, picture. So uh, during the empathizing, we went to this uh, Malawian village where they keep mainly goat and uh, chicken and at some extent uh, swine. So these are the smallholder production system. Uh, where animals are semi-grazed and uh, this is a farmer, she's explaining diarrhea, loss of vision, skin infection are some of the challenges they, they face. And uh, feed is also a problem, that's what she's saying and uh, 
the animals look like uh, they are fed, maybe because they know that we were coming, they might have fed them, but uh, um, even when they were given this concentrate, they, they, they didn't eat it uh, because they have already grazed somewhere. And uh, as you can see on the pen, at the bottom on the floor, they, they raise chicken and the chicken, they pick the ticks. So it's like um, chicken integrated uh, goat production. So the chicken feed on the larvae when the ticks drop from the, from the goats. So this is uh, the chicken is Um, yeah, so uh, in order to prevent this tick and tick borne disease, uh, we tried to produce uh, technologies that help to apply acaricides, particularly in Africa. And we produced two prototypes. One is multi-purpose treatment cage and the other one is uh, a mobile uh, deep tank. So. We produced this from scratch. This is made in Malawi. And uh, mm, so these cages help small farmers, smallholder farmers to, to treat the animal and apply acaricides because uh, deep tanks, they are very expensive. They consume a lot of water. Um, so the multi-purpose uh, treatment cage it can be also used to treat uh, other small animals and uh, for other diseases. It's not only for application of uh, acaricide. And this is a treatment uh, deep tank, uh, which is splash proof because uh, at the top, the uh, when the animal goes into the into the deep then the water raises and uh, spreads horizontally instead of splashing to the ground. So this is splash proof. And um, we tested their advantages and disadvantages uh, of these two deep time, uh, this treatment uh, technologies uh, based on cost, efficacy, speed of application, um, use is easy to use. So uh, this is a side. Putting in the deep tanks. So this is a treatment deeping of the goats in the tank. So we found that this, this dip is uh, speedy in comparison to the treatment cage. However, this one needs more labor than, and uh, it's effective because uh, lots of the acaricide Drain through drainage is minimum. However, the user needs a glove so that make it it might not be accessible to farmers. So this is a treatment cage. So for this one to use, you need a spray. Uh, we use it also for dog, cat, and swine. It's very effective. So we, would, we wanted to make a light one so that people can carry it on bike and when they arrive in the village, they can treat animals.
So the, the farmers, because they know the problem of tick and tick-borne disease, if you dig their animals and treat them, they are very happy. So they are very happy to bring their animals for treatment and pay. Also, the cost is about 20 kwacha per goat. One dollar is uh, nowadays about 900 kwacha. So in, with 20 kwacha, one can treat uh, with 100 kwacha, five times nine is 45 animals for one dollar. We also try to improve the feed, feeding nutrition of the animals. So we fistulated some animals and we tried to study the rumen bugs by adding several substances that facilitate digest, digestibility. So like if the animals are fed mineral leaks, digestibility also increases. Um, so this is our farm, just, uh, we do also crossbreeding. This is a boar goat. And we do keep also the chicken. So in this farm, chicks are less because the, these ducks and chicks, they, they pick the, the ticks. So crop residues, they are not used as feed. Mostly they are burned. Even they are not composted, so it is wastage. There's a lot of grass. It's not cut before much. This is a deep tank, which is abundant because it requires a lot of water. Cleaning is difficult. And once some animals go into this, then the other farmers, they resist because the water gets dirty. So they think it's not all, all, um, good to use. So um, they are reluctant to dip their animals in communal uh, concrete deep tanks. And the other thing is that it's tight for transmission of disease because that carcid kills the tick, not the bacteria and whatever or the viruses which go into the deep. So uh, communal deep tanks, they are abundant. They use a lot of water, a lot of acaricide, costly, and uh, gathering of animals from different areas and going to the deep is uh, for disease transmission. So this is like a well with no water because of the drought, climate change, there's no water. So leave alone to fill that deep tank, there is no water for the villages. So when they abandon the deep tank, also this is a veterinary office. Uh, it's also abandoned. I can see some beer bottles there, it's Dr. Adam who said. It. <laughs> so it's abandoned, so it needs just uh, reorganizing the veterinary system. This was a veterinary office in the past. So few veterinarians, uh, no resources, no water. So these are the, the, the main problems. So the main tick and tick bondies are like heart water, anaplasmosis and babesiosis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. That was great. I'm really sorry about the sound, make you having to speak over. But anyway, that was really useful. So, the, yeah, the main question that came up was what are the tick-borne tick diseases that, that um, you're mainly concerned with? And I think you've just answered that for us. So that's great. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. So, so Prof's not only a remarkable professor, but he's also available for lip syncing for film as well. <laughs> Great efforts, brilliant. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for that, Adam, very helpful. Okay, so Precious, this is your piece now. Are you, so are you gonna see if you can run the sound, Philippa, or is Precious gonna have to speak over? 
Uh, I'm hi there. Apologies, apologies, Prof. Thank you very much. That was that was excellent. Um, apologies about that. I'm going to try the sound again, and if not, I um, hopefully Precious will will be able to speak over this. Um, so let's just try. Hello, everyone. I'm Precious Massa, student at Monda, Equestrian College of Nairobi University. Of On volume. volume bilateral transmission. Not loud enough, Philippa. We'll have to, Precious will probably have to step up. Okay. All right, sure, no problem. So, yeah, um, my presentation is on volume bilateral tendon exit in um, dromedary camel and uh, some tr disease transmission between sheep, goats, and camels. So what you're seeing there is a dromedary camel. She's a baby. By the time we we're attending to, to her, she was um, four months old and of about 150 kgs or so in weight. Uh, her mother died from blood loss after there was a uterine prolapse and uh, consequently, there was a uterine artery rupture. So sad. Yeah, so from then, Anna was raised on uh, cow milk. Um, unfortunately, they had cows on the, on the farm. And later, in about four weeks, in about two weeks later, she developed uh, what you're seeing there, um, where the white arrows are. Uh, that's a quarter flexion of the... Um, um, the radio carpal joint. Apparently, that is not supposed to be so. Um, so that's quite an abnormality, as you saw it. And to it, there are about three possible differential causes that uh, we, are, uh, we thought of. The first one is physical trauma, because uh, from then, from the time of birth, she was being given, uh, she was kept in a room that was quite slippery. It was cemented. And um, the other one is uh, the possible calcium deficiency. So um, she was being given cow milk. And on, um, on administration, is, it was um, very diluted on administration all the time. And the other possible differential is um, hereditary, a hereditary issue. Why we thought of this is because um, Anna, Anna's mother developed a similar problem when she was born um, in the early stages. So, yes. Um, uh, I think the video was moved a little back. Just we wait for, yep. Yeah. So yeah, as I talked about the possible uh, differential causes, there was a physical trauma, nutritional calcium deficiency, and um, a possible hereditary cause to it, because the mother also had a similar problem when she was just born in, the, in, in her early stages. However, it was managed quite early. Yeah. Um, so uh, when the case was presented to us, um, we happened to have uh, managed it with uh, a splint cast, just so that we try to maintain the um, physical anatomy of the joint um, and possible um, management of it. And we also started to, to give her calcium supplement uh, pills and we advised for a possible adjustment of um, uh, calcium inclusion in the diet as well. However, the prognosis to this was a bit bad. Uh, why I say this is because this case developed at two weeks, as I said, 
However, it was reported like f um, close to four months or so later, um, which uh, would make the tendon quite uh, quite loose as well. And uh, yeah, the prognosis to possible um, treatment is bad. Yeah, and um, so sorry to say, Anna didn't make it. Well, she died from something else. Um, it was from um, aspiration. She vomited and uh, she aspired the, uh, the vomitus in the end. So that is sad to say, uh, but we really did try the best we could. So from this, I'll, I'll talk about um, the possible transmission of diseases between sheep, goats, and uh, camels. Why I chose this is because these animals are sometimes kept together. And um, a very good example of uh, where uh, baby Anna was, uh, was being kept, uh, it was a farm where they had sheep as well. So they were keeping sheep uh, together with camels. Yeah, uh, so the first is, um, um, I'll talk about some, some of the parasitic diseases that are quite common. Um, and these are nematodal or cestodal diseases. So this can occur concurrently or singly. So it could either be a nematodal or cestodal combination of, uh, of um, uh, infestation or just nematodes alone or just cestodes alone. Yeah. So for nematodes, we have um, all those um, uh, like trichostongulus uh, species, then uh, Ostagia species, and Ostafogostomum as well. Yeah. And for cestodes, cestodes can either be, can, can, can infest the sheep and goats as well as um, uh, camels as either larva or as larva or as the adult worm. So we are worried about um, systems like Monese expansa, uh, um, Avitalina, Centropacta, um, and uh, sort of mention for, for the larval stages uh, there is hydratosis and cystosecosis that we, we are worried about. And uh, Echinococcus polymorphous uh, is, uh, is nautic, that is quite common in, in camels. And the other um, big issue is uh, fasciolosis, which is quite fatal when it infects uh, sheep and goats. Um, and all this system does really put uh, the sheep and goats uh, to some risk and in some extent. And the others are uh, trypanosomiasis uh, and uh, coccidiosis. So for trypanosomiasis, we are worried, uh, especially if the farm is quite close to where we have um, sets of flies, for example. Now, uh, there are bacterial diseases to it as well. Um, so for those who joined the first, uh, um, the first uh, presentation by David, uh, you remember him mentioning about vaccinating against some posterior diseases. So posterior diseases are quite a big challenge as well to sheep and goats. So as you can see, there is anthrax, the black leg, um, tetanus, and botulism, as well as uh, enterotoxemia. So these are costridal diseases, and that you can uh, from there you can tell that really uh, 
clostridial disease is uh, quite common and really do pose a big, um, a, a big challenge as well. Uh, however, the good thing to it is that there are vaccines to it, to these diseases. And there are the diseases are like salmonellosis, uh, blue cellosis, uh, tuberculosis, Q fever, and infestation from, um, I should say, colibacillosis from um, Escherichia coli as well. Well, just to mention that um, for tuberculosis, it's really not much of a challenge. Well, it can happen. However, sheep and goats are quite resistant to this, uh, to this disease. However, the problem just comes in when you're doing, when you're slaughtering them um, in the in the abattoirs, where there can be condemnation uh, because of the possible issues that uh, can 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 come in from from um, from infection of tuberculosis. Yeah. Well, um, there is, uh, I think, one more slide, uh, just a bit further. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the very last one that I prepared on was um, on some of the viral diseases. Um, and um, if you remember, there was a talk on uh, PPI, a very good one. Um, so PPI is a very big challenge as well. Um, and we have issues of... Uh, Lift Valley fever, uh, bloating, and off as well. And Levy's is uh, it's not a very big challenge, but while it can be, especially if your area is quite endemic to rabies, where you would have, for example, for areas where, that, um, that are more susceptible to dog mediated uh, uh, rabies transmission, you would have such a challenge as. Um, especially from stray or free roaming dogs, say if they're infected and they, they attack your flock. So this would be much of a challenge as well. Yeah. Otherwise, um, that's all uh, I, I, I had prepared. And thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Precious. Thank you for, for managing to talk over. That was a really good job. Um, the the um, you mentioned the clostridial. Do do you use much clostridial vaccine? Is it available for you guys to use? Yes, um, it is. Uh, however, I think much of an access is is in the is for those who are who have big farms. Yeah. So, however, for the for the small holder farmers, it's quite a big challenge for them. As um, I think much of it is to do with. Um, uh, financial challenges to to access it yeah otherwise uh, for the big farms um, they really do uh, vaccinate their, their their flock against costrio diseases and could i ask you about tuberculosis is that a, is that a worry as a, a zoonotic between you you guys potentially catching it as owners of animals and, and being a veter veterinarian is, is that a, do you consider that a risk well um for in regards to potential, um, I would say it's a potential um, threat, yeah, but it's not much of a challenge, especially if you're working with sheep and goats. Um, the, much of a worry is from, from, from cattle, because uh, here in this region of, uh, I should say in Malawi, um, the bigger challenge of it is in, in, is in the cow heads and not uh, sheep and goats. Thank you. And final question, there's somebody's just put a question in the question and answer about has PPR been reported in Malawi yet or not?
just antibody positive as we heard from Felix. Is that correct? Uh, no, it's not been reported. Well, that's good news. Thank yeah, you. Sure. That's terrific. Thank you very much for covering that. So thank you so much. Thank you. So we're going to move on to Laston and it may well be you'll have to speak over as well, Laston. We'll see how it goes. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, you guys, did you listen something? Uh, I'll be explaining to you about possible disease transmission at World Life and uh, Livestock Interface. To begin with, in Malawi, we have about four World Life Reserves, five national parks, and three natural sanctuaries. And and these natural sanctuaries, they are located in the major cities of Malawi. And these protected areas represent 13 biotic communities of animal species, of which birds are the most diverse ones. And uh, some of the animals which you can see and work with in the wildlife sector is uh, elephants, buffaloes, black lino, lions, cheetah, hyenas, zebras, sable antelopes, water bugs, bush bugs, just to mention a few. And the carrying capacity of these uh, wildlife reserves, also national parks, is different based on the management level and also carrying capacity of the park. Generally in Malawi, we face a number of challenges in wildlife, including poaching, illegal wildlife trade, encroachment, as well as some diseases such as anthrax. And we had a, uh, a case of outbreak of anthrax in 2018 at Rwanda National Parks, where about 40 hippos died. Encroachment is also a problem, as I said. Some other diseases are tuberculosis, pluralism, avian influenza, and duck peg. As a vet student, I've done my rotations in national parks, and uh, I was involved in putting cola in, uh, in lions, elephants, and uh, lions, as well as hyenas. You see some of those pictures in the following slides and monitoring uh, those animals using veg collars and transmitter to track the lions, li cheetahs, sable, lions at Rwanda National Park and Good World Life Reserve in Malawi, and caring and attending to injured wild animals, such as sable, zebra, which were affected by snares as poaching is a problem in Malawi, conducting heavy checks to resident and new intakes at Long World Life Center, and also responding to wildlife life emergency calls and conflict. And as I said, some of the slides will portray that. But just to mention a few, that some of the possible diseases that can be transmitted from uh, wildlife to livestock, as my, my colleague said, precious, PVR, in the first experience, they said that it can be transmitted from small luminance, world luminance. And also, there was a case uh, in German, which they say malignant catastrophe that was found in sheep, but it was also isolated in wild animals. And alpha heavy virus, which is most, uh, com which is more li related to bovine heavy virus one, and we have some parasitic diseases such as study, pastulosis, and sheep measles. When we mention of uh, tick-borne diseases, we say we have theorosis, blue tongue, blue cirrhosis, and paratuberculosis. Paratuberculosis. The list are. A blue tank, blue cysts, and plagiarogosis are not part of the tick borne diseases, but they are also a challenging disease which can be transmitted from modern animals to, to sheep and goats. In the first picture there, I'm showing you. In the first picture there, I'm showing you when uh, we were receiving some black rhinos from South Africa in November 2019, where I was being conducting, I was conducting uh, health checks in those black rhinos. And in the other picture, I was monitoring one of the sedated black lino when we were doing some VHF collars. And in this picture, I was working on a zebra with my colleague, and we were doing a, that zebra was affected by a snare, and it was badly injured in the leg, and we had to put that cast so that it can be supported and walk properly. Unfortunately, it didn't make it, we had to euthanize it because it won't survive in the in the park where there are predators and it will be an easy pick. In the other picture, I was working on a hyena. On this hyena, there is a lot of wildlife conflict where people have uh, cut down trees in the area where this, these hyenas were considering home. 
and the, at the end of the results, there were no game animals for these animals to feed on, and they opted for livestock such as goats and dogs for humans. And that also poses a risk of disease transmission for more life to livestock. <clears throat> so when we, we receive the call that he, these hyenas are causing havoc in the area by killing one of the individual, we went in and we translocated six hyenas from that area to Leonde National Park, that was a success. And in this picture, that's one of the other uh, hyena which we translocated from that area. And on this one, I was also monitoring uh, an animal which was sedated and we are putting a gauge collar on it. On this picture, uh, this is a water bag, which was uh, a victim to poaching. Uh, unfortunately, the poachers failed to get access to it because it ran into a water hole and they failed to pick it up. And when the rangers were doing their morning monitoring, they found it and they brought it as us for post-mortem, and that was the post-mortem that I was conducting on it. On this picture, these are the videos which, uh, which we collected when we were, when we were sedating, a, when we were sedating a, an elephant. This elephant was moving out of a park and causing problems in the people's clubs. Possibly it can also be a disease transmission factor because uh, these elephants can leave dung which can have some parasites and when sheep and goats eat in those areas they can get the disease and on the other one i was trying to see the i was monitoring the anesthesia like the death of respiration the respiratory rate and the like that's what i'm very similar to doing thank you oh that was terrific thank you very much for that Lester. can i i've got one question i could I ask you, uh, if, if you're um, transporting hyenas from one area to, to another, how, how, easy, can't tell you, can't. how easy is it for them to integrate once they get to a new area? Is that a problem? Can you come again? I can't. If you, the, the hyenas that you were sedating and transferring to another area, how easy is it for them to integrate in a new area? Yes. Uh, first, of, first of all, we hold them in the bomber for at least a month so that they can be in quarantine. We can keep on monitoring them. We do some tests on them, but probably labels is our main worry. So in the process of having them in a bomber, we're checking that they were not seeing any clinical signs for labels and another disease so that we, we don't have to introduce labels into a pack and don't have to introduce some other diseases into a pack. So we quarantine them in a bomber for at least a month. Now they're in quarantine, they haven't released them yet. Great, thank you. That covers that. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question, Laston, too? Laston, um, you're going to graduate this year, is that is that right? From Luana? Yes. So obviously yes. you've got an interest in um, as well as farming. How do you, are you involved in the education of farmers to see the benefits of of promoting wildlife and, and, and tourism in Malawi. Have you been involved in that to date or would you, you interested in that? You, you, you're asking if I'm interested in what right? Uh -huh. And the education, of, because yes, the farm uh, community obviously see challenges with these elephants causing destruction of farmland and predators as well. What's your feeling about it? Yeah. And about that, that conflict you have in, in resources in Malawi? Mm -hmm. I didn't get the question. Can you repeat, please? It's Sorry. Right. Are you involved? Do you do you believe in the education of the local farmers? See the benefits of, and are you going to be promoting that once you graduate of wildlife in Malawi? Yeah, well, actually, I'll be practicing as a wildlife vet if I get a chance. If I go further with education, I want to help with wildlife sector because these problems of uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. As a vet, we needed to bring in, like, to control the animals from moving out into the park by putting effective measures, measures, effective measures where we do coloring of the elephants, and then we monitor where their movement, day-to-day day -day movement, and then we can come in when the animals move out of the park, and then we protect people's property in that way, and we can also protect people's lives because we had a case last year where elephants killed it. 
uh, a human in Kota Kota, and in that case, people were very curious to the park and they destroyed property of the park. So that was a huge disagreement between them. So I think venturing into wildlife life would be a good way. Yeah, so definitely I'll, I'll try my best to do all that. Brilliant. I don't Absolutely. know if that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have future. a couple of questions for you, Professor. May I ask you, I've got a couple of questions on the chat line. One's from, if I can get the gentleman's the name, Boniface Chiku Fenji. He said, we've heard of trypanosomiasis in most of these wildlife reserves. How serious is the condition in the reserves that you have? That you have? You hear that? Yeah. Yes, we have serious cases of tribe anosomiasis. One of it is at Vaza Wildlife Reserve, where the ticks there are positive, and it's a major challenge indeed. And there is need of uh, research and how to control it. It has to be done. Yes, we have those cases in wildlife. It's true. Okay, and the second question to, to any of you who would like to answer it is how do you manage fasciolysis? In, in Malawi, do you what medication do you use? If you could answer that. Ah, oh, okay. Um, for basically, we, we are just we just use drugs like abandons or and everything. But uh, we do not have um, this plus drugs. Lassen, you ask Precious to unmute. Okay, Precious, can you unmute? Hello. Hello. You can. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, so I was saying that um, for Fasura, here we basically just choose uh, drugs like Abendazole. Otherwise, we don't have um, this third, third gen uh, drugs, sure. Okay. Um, I've got a, another question. This is from one of our university lecturers. Um, they're interested to know how you see the future for vets in Malawi. Whether you think there's the potential to educate more homegrown students to become vets and what, how do you see their careers going forward? How do you see their opportunities? Can you answer that, Prof, or you guys? Yeah, like according to the FAO recommendation, at least uh, for 100,000 population, there should be one veterinarian, a minimum. So at least there is a bright future for Malawi. One, it is a small country. So if they invest in education, then they can, uh, they can sustain it. They have a lot of wasteland with a lot of pasture. So animal production can increase. There are a lot of people unemployed. So this can be means of employment. And the demand for meat is very high here because uh, people eat unconventional animals, including mice, termites, what, what, birds. So uh, we, we need to increase production and milk consumption per capita is very low. But there is a potential crop residue. All the crop residue is burned. It's not fed to animals. So they, they rely on chemical fertilizers instead of manure. Other thing is that uh, one hills, this is hot spot. A lot of emerging diseases so needs collaboration between human health, veterinary and environmental health. So uh, for the next 10, 20 years, uh, I see positive things. After that, uh, God knows. 
Do you see? Do you see your government prepared to put more money into this? Do you think the government sees it this as a priority? So far, only one or two of our graduates were employed by government, but mostly uh, they are expected to do private. So, um, government should put resource definitely because agriculture crop agriculture is not sustainable because of drought and flooding so animal production uh, is good like uh, is a good strategy to cap from these disasters because it can move the animals and if in case crop fail it can feed the crop residue to uh, the animals so only relying on crop is is not good because government is putting subsidizing farmers for fertilizer but not for livestock owners so they, they must put they must make an effort to, to put uh, but not heavy investment you know in africa in general uh, most governments except in Botswana and uh, this Namibia, where they export meat to the European uh, community. And there is one, like a good initiation in, by one of the meat companies here, producing organic meat and to export. And some of the African nations are getting richer, like Angola, uh, Nigeria, so they need meat. So you, even if not possible to export to Europe, they can export. So they can generate uh, income. So uh, forex. So uh, what I see is that uh, I don't see any negative things. Thank you very much. Nick, can I make a can I make a um, a, a pitch on behalf of Prof Malaku? Is that possible? just to say that he's, he's a brilliant professor, but he is quite a lonely professor at the moment. He probably needs more colleagues. Perfect. <laughs> Go ahead, please do send them. Go ahead. Country. So if there's anyone uh, dropping into this who feels like, like they'd like a trip to a wonderful country to join the professor for as long as possible to help this add to his team and staff, and then create more of the Malawian vets of the future. I know Sil Neil Sargeson is rather brilliant as well as on this as well. And he was the, the chap I was referring to earlier who said how brilliant the students were. So the more people from overseas who can go and help Professor whilst they build up the numbers of vets in Malawi over the next few years, the better. So Prof, I'm sure you'd be very open to anyone offering to come and help build your team of uh, professors and lecturers in Luana. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adam. Thank you, Adam. Uh, brilliant man, but he can't do it all by himself. Isn't Thank that you. right, last and precious? You quite like a few other faces to look at, at the chalkboards. Thank you. I'm good at think about we, we, we're coming to the end of our, our allotted slot. We have the benefit of having wonderful sponsors in this country that help us put things like this on. And we have a big thank you to Siva who have sponsored this particular presentation. Um, and we, we made special thanks and, and reference to them for, for showing an interest in, in supporting these guys who are doing a wonderful job out in Malawi. And Professor, I think you are, you are a, a terrific fellow and I think you're an inspiration to us all. And these two guys here, if they represent what you've achieved, then they are also a, credit to their country and it's been a pleasure to have you guys take your time to speak to us and for that we are very grateful. So on behalf of the Sheep Veterinary Society, our sponsors Siva and Philippa and Fiona and of course Adam, thank you Lastin, thank you Precious and above all thank you very much Malaku for providing us with a fantastic insight into your wonderful country. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>